So the title we're going to address at first, compare the way the poets present ideas about guilt in the Lamas piling and Giuseppe. And the biggest thing is don't worry at all um, whether you use single inverted quotations or double inverted quotations. I don't mind at all as long as your consistency is on the back of that one for you guys. It's a double sided one. Wonderful. So compare the way poets present ideas about guilt in Lamas and Giuseppe. Now, this is one of the ways you can plan. This is one of the ways you can plan. But before we go any further, let's read the poem. Let's read the poem. So if we turn, first of all, after the fair, I'd still a light heart and a heavy purse. So he has still got a light heart and a heavy purse. So he's happy and he's got money. He'd struck so cheap. And cattle doted on him. In his time, mine only dropped heifers, fat as cream. So, of course, in a herd, you want female cows. Because if you have male cows, you have to put them down. Because they don't produce milk. Yields doubled. I grew fond of company that knew when to shut up. Then one night, disturbed from dreams of my dear late wife, I hunted down her torn voice to his pale form. Stock still in the light from the dark lantern, stark naked but for one bloody boot of fox trap. I knew him a warlock, a cow with leather horns. To go into the hair gets you muckle sorrow, the wisdom runs muckle care. I levelled and blew the small hour through his heart. The moon came out. By its yellow witness, I saw him fur over like a stone mossing. His lovely head thin, his top lip gathered, his eyes rose like bread. I carried him in a sack that grew lighter with every step and dropped him from a bridge. There was no splash. Now my herd is elf shot. I don't dream, but spend my nights casting ball from half crowns and my days here. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been an hour since my last confession. So let's very quickly run through it thinking about guilt. So you think for a moment, what lines struck you? So what lines struck you? So if you take a highlighter now, and let's practice what we just decided we were going to do. So we've read it aloud and we've gone there and we can picture it. And I heard in my mind when I was reading it, I heard the end of a fair and fun and, you know, selling and buying. He makes a deal. And the cattle love this worker, cream, yields. And I picture them at the end of the first stanza sitting together in this kind of comfortable silence. And then what does strike me is that then one night the word disturbed. That strikes me. That line really strikes me. Disturbed from dreams of my dear late wife. So we've suddenly realised you suddenly realised his wife is dead. So that's a sudden realisation. Feel free to write that on your poem. And then the line that then, those two lines together actually really strike me. I hunted down her torn voice to his pale form. So I think that really strikes me. Torn voice, pale form. And we've got this and that, for me, is a really confusing image. That, that's what strikes me. That's what I feel when I read it. It's confusing and, and, he's, and there's torn, there's brokenness. That's what strikes me. That's it, isn't it? It's the brokenness. Stock still in the light from the dark lantern, stark naked but for one bloody boot. And we've got this horrid image, haven't we, of this worker naked except for this trap 
And then we've got this magical realism. Did you know that? In a sense, this mixture of what we know and what we don't know. I knew him, a warlock, a cow with leather horns. And then we've got this idiom. Idiom. You probably know this. So idiomatic phrase to get you into a hair. To go into the hair gets you muckle sorrow. The wisdom runs. Muckle. Much. Muckle is much sorrow. Much care. To get into a situation with a warlock will cause you much sorrow, much care. So if you said you feel full of care and woe, you're weighed down by leveled. Now, a bullet is a small hour, as you know, small hour through his heart. And the moon came out by his yellow witness. And then we've got this metamorphosis. Now this, I'm going to say it now, is different. This is different to Giuseppe. In Giuseppe, she stays a mermaid. In this one, the warlock retreats back into being a hare. I saw him fur over like a stone mossing. I love that line. As if retreating back into its natural state, like a stone mossing, retreating back into a natural state. And then we see his eyes rising, his lovely head thinned, his top lip gathered. I am excellent at art. His eyes rose like bread. They rise to the sides of his head. And then we've got this. I carried him in a sack that grew lighter at every step and dropped him from a bridge. There was no splash. And my herd is elf shot. Isn't it interesting? As if the herd has been shot by an elf because he shot the hireling. And then this really interesting thing, I don't dream. I don't dream. It's even implying he doesn't sleep. I don't dream, but spend my nights casting balls from half crowns. So he spends all of his time making, turning money, half crowns, into lead bullets, into bullets. So he started with money and he finishes with bullets. It's interesting, isn't it? Starts with money and finishes by changing his money. And that's what he does at night. The mystery hours and my days here. Just circle that word, here. And we think, where's here? Why, what is here? He started by saying, after the fair, after the fair. We think, where, where is here? And then we suddenly move to the present. We suddenly move to the present. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been an hour since my last confession. An hour through a small hour through his heart. It's been an hour since my last confession. So we've got a sense of time, bullet, death, life. But of course, that's this endless cycle that he's now trapped in. At night, he makes bullets. And in the day, he confesses again and again and again. And again, every hour, an endless cycle of guilt. It's amazing, isn't it? It's absolutely amazing. I'll just check for now. Okay? And I think that's the really exciting thing about it. Let's now read Giuseppe. I'm going to read it through once. And this time, as we go, really here, and then straight afterwards, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, all on your own, to just do that. What's the line that strikes you? What really makes you feel what intrigues you, what angers you, what upsets you, what strikes you. The first time, let's just read it all the way through. Don't worry about annotating the first time through. And in the exam, we would do this really swiftly. But I'm going to read it so we really lose ourselves. My uncle Giuseppe told me that in Sicily, in World War II, in the courtyard behind the aquarium, where the bougainvillea grows so well, the only captive mermaid in the world, was butchered on the dry and dusty ground by a doctor, a fishmonger and certain others. She, it, had never learned to speak because she was so simple, so they said. But the priest who held one of her hands while her throat was cut said she was only a fish and fish can't speak. But she screamed like a woman in terrible fear. 
And when they took a ripe golden row from her side, the doctor said this is proof she was just a fish and anyway an egg is not a child, but refused when someone's offered to. Then they put her head and her hands in a box for burial and someone tried to take her wedding ring, but the others stopped him and the ring stayed put. The rest they cooked and fed to the troops. They said a large fish had been found on the beach. Starvation forgives men many things, my uncle, the aquarium keeper, said, but couldn't look me in the eye, for which I thank God. Okay, on your own, I'll give you 30 seconds, I'll keep the recording going. What lines really strike you? I'm going to do it while you do it. Okay, what lines strike you? What upsets you? What do we feel? So really interesting. One thing that really, really strikes me about the poem is the word starvation. I don't know about you guys, and totally, you have your own, you will have your own, and that's absolutely right about poetry analysis. I think starvation is a really interesting one. The starvation forgives many things, and the implication is, but not this, but not this. Starvation forgives men many things, men, but. Starvation forgives men many things, my uncle isn't, but it's reported speech. That's why his uncle says, but. Also what strikes me, and this always strikes me, the, I love the beginning. Bougainvillea, and I can picture the flowers, beautiful flowers. And then immediately afterwards, the bougainvillea grows so well, the yeah, captive mermaid butchered. What's interesting is that's earlier on in the poem than in Lamas. It's earlier on in the poem, that shop. In Lamas, it's positive a little longer, but then there is that similar shock. He stands at three, I leveled and blew the small hour through his heart. But this one, we've got that sense of beauty and brokenness right from the beginning, haven't we? We've got the sense of beauty and brokenness right from the beginning. Whereas for me, there's guilt at the beginning of Lamas, but you don't quite know why. There's a sense of unease. So we've got a sense of unease in both. Unease. More shocking, I think, in Giuseppe. More shocking because you've got a captive mermaid butchered. You've got much more violent imagery from the beginning. At the beginning of Lamas, you have more sense of struck, fair, heavy purse, struck so cheap, cattle, doted, batter's cream, yield, double, fond of company. And then the, the first word that really starts to, to um, give us that sense of deep unease is disturbed from dreams of my dear late wife by hunted, torn, pale. Let's just quickly flip over to the other poem. Disturbed from dreams, dear late wife, hunted, torn, pale. So we've suddenly got negative language in Lamas. Disturbed from dreams, my dear late wife, I hunted down her torn voice, pale form. Disturbed, late wife, hunted, torn, pale. Whereas I think an interesting thing is from the beginning of Giuseppe, we've got this real negativity quite early on, which is quite disturbing. You've also got lots of other things that are guilt. My uncle, so it's being reported, whereas what's interesting, of course, in Lamas, is it I. The narrator is confessing to us. The narrator is confessing to us. It's very immediate. After the fair, I'd. The narrator is confessing to us. It's immediate. Write that on your page. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's a confession to us that he still feels hourly. He still feels guilt. He still feels brokenness every hour. This is now. This is now. Whereas Giuseppe is the uncle telling the narrator who avoids his eyes. It's slightly distanced, isn't it? 
My uncle Giuseppe told me that in Sicily in World War II. We've got a sense of distance. So that's a difference. A04, a difference between the two. But another difference is that the Roderick Ford Giuseppe is much more openly horrific. Right on your page. The or on your planning sheet or a piece of line paper, whatever suits. Um, what's different is that Giuseppe is much more bluntly horrific. The key difference is Giuseppe is more bluntly horrific because of the stark imagery, this stark imagery, ripe golden roe from her side if she was just a fish and anyway an egg is not a child and then the hands and the head and of course for me i may well be you too someone tried to take her wedding ring did that strike you guys i think that strikes it's different i think for different people and that's absolutely right but when it says and someone tried to take her wedding ring we can so the dehumanization that they are attempting it's very difficult when they're married. Yeah. So suddenly the dehumanization is very hard to sustain when they're married. We can't sustain a sense of them not being human if they wear a wedding ring. So we've got this shocking imagery. Good. Now I'm hoping that has gone through a good few things. Yes, unease is definitely part of the tone. Yes, good point. OK, good. So let's go back to our plan then. So we wrote, how do we compare poems? So we've read the poems, we read them through, and we enjoyed them. We lost ourselves in them, we heard them. What's going on? What do I see? What do I hear? What's your favourite line? And favourite, I don't mean necessarily something you enjoy, but something really strikes you. Which line strikes you? Why is it an emotion, an image? Then we compare what's similar and what's different. Are they just in the same way or differently? Do they start in the same way or differently? Is there a gradual realization? And then we think about how, how are they done? I haven't even thought about that yet. Although I do notice in Giuseppe, the two line stanza. That's the bit I notice the most, the two line stanza, the rest. So that, that's the bit that strikes me. Do they have a similar tone? Yes, I would say so. Now what we're gonna do is we are going to write together. So to your poetry essay, should introduce what your argument is going to be about. Now I'm going to say this various times, but this is the same whatever essay you are doing. Your introduction should lay out the argument you are going to have. And this is the same whether it's poetry, coursework, um, Frankenstein, measure, measure, whatever. It should lay out the argument you're going to have. And that's a really important thing. I always say that when we're prepping for coursework. Your introduction is basically all of your topic sentences. Both poems do this, both novels do this, both coursework texts do this. Or in Frankenstein, we certainly see this. In Measure for Measure, we certainly see this. We also see this in Measure for Measure. And those will be your topic sentences. So that's the introduction. Now I'm going to talk through my planning. OK, I'm going to talk and type at the same time, hopefully. It'll be nonsense, but this is the way I would personally plan. So what are they both saying about guilt? So the first thing I'm thinking of, and I would do this at the same time as if I were you, I'm going to talk through my thinking. So I'm going to do basically a walking, talking poetry prep. First thing is compare. So I'm already thinking similarities and differences. So feel free to write this on your page as I talk. So I'm thinking about the similarities and differences. The ways, it should be actually ways, the poets present ideas about guilt. Now it's just not just guilt, it's ideas about guilt which makes it kind of interesting. It's not just compare guilt, it's ideas about guilt. That strikes me as something I need to consider. Ideas about guilt, how people feel about guilt, how they feel about guilt, how the narrators feel about guilt. So I'm interested by that. So I'm thinking about now the comparison. Both poems explore the effect of killing someone. It sounds really simple, but that is the most important thing about both poems, isn't it? And that's the same. Whenever you're doing an essay, whenever you're doing an essay, the biggest thing I want to see is you address the big issue. Address the big issue. 
You could not talk about measure for measure and either Angelo or Isabella without discussing Act 2, Scene 2 and Act 2, Scene 4. You could not do measure for measure and either Angelo or Isabella without talking about the biggest scene for them both, other than Act 5 for Isabella, where she really comes into her own again. And then, of course, the question at the end is actually you've got the biggest thing. You could not discuss a streetcar named Desire and not discuss the rape scene. Don't avoid the big issue. What's the big thing in your play, in your text, in that poem? OK, both poems. What's the biggest thing? Someone kills someone else. If you had to give a one line praise of both, that's what you'd say. Poems are a confession, although Lamas is more direct. The narrator killed the warlock. Whereas a spell without looking. Both feel guilt that lasts. Guilt lasts. It's not a short term thing. Re admissions. Revelations. Wife. The eggs. The wedding ring. Also, that he hunts down his wife's voice in the warlock. And there's that confusion of him looking for his wife. That's, that's what strikes me in that one. And also, so we've got the wife, Lammas, eggs, the wedding ring, and no dreams. Confession. And they both end with, with confession. One openly seeks confession, bless me, father. The other avoiding the issue, avoiding my eyes. What's interesting, and now and only now am I thinking about how, only now am I thinking about how, Lamas has that sat well plotted. So Lamas is as if the narrator is negotiating his guilt. As if the, he's negotiating his guilt in an ordered way. Six line stanzas. Whereas what's interesting about Giuseppe is there is a brokenness. There is a brokenness. And again, particularly in the last two stanzas. And do you notice how the stanzas get shorter? As if the narrator struggles to tell his uncle's story. And of course, we start by talking about Sicily in World War II when we think he's going to be a war hero. And by the end, we realise he's a killer who doesn't have redemption. Gets more disjointed, gets more brief. The brevity of the last two stanzas is really clear. A four-line stanza and a two-line stanza. OK, lovely. Now, what we're going to do is now we're going to write it. Now we're going to write it. Something I forgot to say, actually, and is definitely worth noting. Anyone else? Feel free to add comments. You guys at home, that's uh, really useful. Good question. How many points would we need? However many you can write in a time? Three, four? If you could get four paragraphs in, in the time, I'd be very surprised. Um, but I might well plan for four and only be able to do three. To a certain extent, if you only did two and they were really good comparisons of two elements of the ways they experience guilt, that's great. So that's a really good question. So I would say the most important thing is that you are looking at um, guilt in the poems and comparing. And if that's only two really good points. So, yeah, so the biggest thing is as long as you are completely integrating your comparison. Actually, another thing I didn't say, and this is worth you guys writing down at home as well is I want you to bring quotations from the two texts together. What I'd like to see is I would want you to make sure that you are drawing a quotation from the first poem and drawing together a quotation from the second and poem We're now together. going to have a little look at writing it. OK, so now I wrote a little bit last night, so I, it's really, really simple and it's going through exactly what we have discussed. So it's just going through the way we've just discussed it. All right, so that's what we're going to do next. Of killing, feel free to stay there, of killing something other. And I think that's a really important thing. It's about killing something that's other. A warlock and a mermaid. And the idea of killing something is different, not quite human. In Lammas, the narrator kills a warlock, yet one who brought him back to memories of his late wife. Likewise, in Giuseppe, the men kill a mermaid. They want to see as merely a fish. 
we are reminded of her humanity. Thus, both poems suggest that destroying creatures, I don't think they are just human. That is that both of them are definitely more than just realist. There's definitely, I don't think we could say that they aren't a mermaid and a warlock. And there's definitely is metamorphosis in Lammas. It's definitely magical realism. It's not realism. And the other one, I think the other thing is about Ian Duke's writing is he's definitely looking at a at a hare. And hares were magical creatures. He's definitely, it's definitely magical. I, it would be too simplistic to say they're real. I, the whole thing of the transformation is the point, is that he was appearing as a human and retreats back into this hair form. It's definitely, definitely a magical poem. So both poems show people who struggle with guilt. Giuseppe, the uncle, experiences guilt as even at the close of the poem. Now, this is something I think is often avoided. Don't be afraid to start at the end of the poems. Don't be afraid to start at the end of the poems, because even at the close, Greater admits my uncle, the aquarium keeper. And of course, the irony of him being the aquarium keeper is he should have kept the mermaid safe. Because he was the one who was keeping the last captive mermaid alive. And at the end, that's what we get reminded with is in keeping the aquarium, even at that point, my uncle, the aquarium keeper, couldn't look me in the eye. And so that's different in that he should have been protecting her. Whereas the difference, of course, is the warlock enters the man's home and is a warlock. He kills him because of realising he's a warlock. Likewise, in Lamas, there is guilt. A more immediate nature, as it is the narrator himself who feels I have sinned. And he admits. So what's interesting is they've both lost something. The narrator in Lamas can't sleep, he doesn't dream. And that hopefully shows you that at the moment, I haven't actually used imagery, I, uh, excuse me, on gone on to use terminology. I could then go on to say, both use images of, they look at guilt. Um, one uses the imagery of them, one night disturbed from dreams of my dear light, late wife and that sense. Uh, and you could talk there about the alliteration. So you could talk about the alliteration and also, that is one point where I might talk about on Jean Mont. Then one night disturbed from dreams. So we've got from the pleasant, I'm just going to write notes actually, from the pleasant to unpleasant in the on Jean Mont. Well, you know this already, but that's how you do a line break. And that is one of the points where I might talk about the alliteration, emphasizes his shock, he's disturbed. Okay. And then I could say similarly. We have the same shocking imagery at the beginning with the Bougainvillea, the captive mermaid, butchered. And I would always, beautiful imagery of the Bougainvillea, and then I would always link whatever I'm saying in the first poem, I always make sure I'm saying the same thing in the second poem. The beautiful imagery of the Bougainvillea, where the Bougainvillea grows so well have this kind of imagine we imagine a kind of beautiful past but then of course with the contrast of the last captive the only captive mermaid on the dry ground so we've got both of the imagery from this beautiful straight into the shocking i would then talk about the guilt that they both experience from that 